Lieutenant Ante Heinemann, 21 years old, from Alley. I still find it hard to believe that I was entrusted with commanding a platoon immediately out of my training. Commanding nearly 50 soldiers, several of whom were already combat veterans from the Winter War. A sergeant and four squad corporals, for example. My platoon at this time consisted of my command squad, which of course included myself and Sergeant Kaskinen, who at some point had acquired a truck from our German friends, stocked it full of ammunition and other supplies, and practically lived in it. He never wanted to let it out of his sight, for fear that someone else might acquire it from us. My command squad also had two other men acting as runners, or orderlies, or stretcher bearers, or whatever tasks they needed filling, and of course the main body of my platoon was made up of the four rifle squads, each made up of nine men, one carrying a light machine gun, and each commanded by a corporal. My baptism of fire was a mopping up operation, clearing out Soviet forces that had been bypassed by the German forces advancing ahead of us. The main enemy position was a pair of bombed out construction warehouses where an unknown number of Soviet tanks had been spotted by our patrols. Our scouts had also reported a secondary concentration of Soviet forces in a small village to the west and a shallow river separating the two main concentrations. Best estimates put enemy strength at a reinforced platoon supported by maybe two light tanks. It was due to this latter threat that I also had an anti-tank rifle team assigned to my platoon from company. And rather excitingly for us all, we were to have our own tank support. Tanks were few in number in our army, and so when I was briefed that we were to have a tank in support, a T-26, my platoon were of course very happy. However, the armoured support arrived several hours late, meaning our operation started in broad daylight rather than during the early hours. Furthermore, the T-26 had not actually arrived. Its crew did, however, led by a Sergeant Yanni Kamelainen, a rather angry professional soldier, angry because his tank had been temporarily reassigned and his crew split between a T-20 armoured tractor and an old Renault FT-17, neither of which had more than a machine gun for its weaponry. But regardless, the tankmen were of course very welcome. In time, I would get very used to changes of plans and delays. At last, my platoon reached the jumping off point and we began our operation. My leading squads had only patrolled forward a couple score of metres when they were engaged by enemy pickets. These men were easily dealt with, but it was clear that the enemy were fully alerted to our presence. Our advance though, not heavily opposed, first, soon came to a temporary halt. Our axis of advance directly towards the warehouses from the north, seemed relatively clear, at least as seen from the marshy, dried up riverbed from which my men were taking cover and returning the enemy fire. We couldn't push on just yet. Enemy forces were probing towards my right flank. Sergeant Kamelainen in his old FT-17 was just getting his tank into position to guard our right when cries of TANK! TANK! rang out amongst my men. And indeed, the rumble of an engine and the clanging of tracks could be heard coming from the direction of the warehouses. Through the trees to our front came the form of a Soviet T-26. Fortunately, it was a model 1931, a twin turreted hull armed with machine guns and not a larger caliber weapon. Nevertheless, my men went to ground, some throwing their smoke grenades for cover, whilst our anti-tank men engaged it with their 20mm rifle. I was of course very glad that my company CO had assigned them to me, otherwise my soldiers would have been left with little choice but to either retreat or assault a tank dropping grenades or molotovs through its hatches, and that would have proved costly. Several 20mm rounds struck the tank, and it wasn't long before the crew were bailing out and running for their lives. And so, with the tank dealt with, our advance once again continued on towards the warehouses, Sergeant Kamelainen, in his FT-17, stayed put and continued to hold at bay enemy soldiers attempting to harass our right flank. I assigned an infantry squad to support him, whilst the rest of the platoon would assault the warehouses together with the T-20 armoured tractor. 
I ordered two of my squads to take up a position in a trench that had been left abandoned by the enemy. From there, we could bring the enemy in and around the warehouses under suppressing fire. I wanted to push another squad up on the left flank, but the enemy at this point began to counterattack. The Soviets were coming forward in suicidal frontal attacks. The T-20's machine gun was blazing away, mowing them down as they came. Two thoughts came to my mind. Firstly, the thought that some cowardly commissar was pushing these young conscripts out of their potentially very formidable defensive positions to their deaths. Secondly, the thought crossed my mind that enemy numbers were clearly underestimated. Their numbers were such that our T-20 gunner soon ran out of ammunition and the tractor had to pull back to restock from Sergeant Kaskinen's truck. Fortunately, the enemy appeared to have shot its bolt and my riflemen were able to pick off the stragglers. It was only whilst writing up our after action report that I realised fate must have been on my side. The T-20, having run out of ammunition, had gone back to restock. This had in turn delayed our assault upon the warehouses. And it was only after the T-20 returned that an enemy light tank made itself known. Without our delay, caused by the T-20 restocking its ammunition, my men would have very likely been caught out in the open, and the enemy tank would have blazed away with its machine guns, mowing them down as they came. Instead, as it burst through the warehouse doors, my men were sitting in the trenches. I could hear the anti-tank rifle blazing away, firing as fast as the men could load it, and one round appeared to have punctured a fuel tank, because before long, the enemy tank was on fire. My squads now took the opportunity to move up to the warehouses, closing the distance with any Soviets still alive there, and so stormed the buildings. But, as they moved up, the high-pitched descending whistle marking the passage of a mortar bomb filled the air. The explosion was relatively small, but frightfully accurate. My men, moving towards the large buildings, picked up their pace. The T-20 suddenly roared to life, and went bouncing across the ground at surprisingly high speed. It seems that the driver, or the gunner, had sported the firing position of the mortar and was charging its position. It narrowly avoided a direct hit from a falling mortar bomb, but moments later, the T-20's machine gun roared into life, firing a long series of bursts. I heard the mortar fire one last time, before the T-20 machine gun went quiet, and the hyper sound of a screaming shell filled the air, followed by the crash of the bomb. There was then, what appeared to be for a few moments, absolute silence. Word quickly reached me as my men shouted the relayed message. We had two men down, and both were very obviously dead. The last mortar bomb had landed right amongst second squad, killing a rifleman and the corporal commanding the squad. A Winter War veteran. My first experience of men dying was under my command. But the warehouses were cleared, however, and now it was time to push west across the shallow river and secure the village. No Soviets had shown their faces from that direction for some time. Nevertheless, we had already underestimated their numbers. Sergeant Ken Elenen, together with the infantry squad that had been guarding our right flank, pushed across the river. They'd met no resistance whilst doing so, and were able to take cover on the other side, gaining a foothold whilst the rest of the platoon crossed the river. Sergeant Kenelainen now spotted Soviet infantrymen taking up defensive positions and immediately opened fire with his machine gun with brutal effect. Any Soviet survivors on this side of the river were now pinned down or trying to escape. The T-20 set up a blocking position on the left flank, stopping any enemies escaping down the main road. The rest of the platoon set up defensive positions around the village. We had achieved our objectives. Our first mission together was complete. I, as well as many others within my platoon who had not seen action before, had at last been bloodied. Regrettably, it had cost us the lives of two men, but enemy numbers had been far higher than we had first believed. Far from being a single platoon supported by tanks, it had turned out to be two slightly understrength platoons, one on each side of the river, and we had successfully served them out.
Lieutenant Hainanen's and Sergeant Kenan Aylin's war has only just begun. In the next episode, they're called forward to defend against a heavy enemy attack.